from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's coming up. Joining us this week for the cattle market segment, Iowa State University's Lee Schultz. He'll discuss the opportunities for you producers to profit from backgrounding those stalker calves this fall. And he'll look ahead to the USDA's Cattle on Feed report to be released this Friday. Then a featured speaker at the 2018 K-State Ranching Summit here in Manhattan last week from the University of Nebraska, Tom Field, will talk about what he terms disruptive technologies and why you cattle producers should take advantage of those when feasible. And Jeff Wickman has this week's 4-H segment. He'll talk with K-State's Daryl Waldron about this year's 4-H Dog Conference and Quiz Bowl. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening once again. And we turn now to a livestock economist out of Iowa State University for this week's observations on the cattle markets, Lee Schultz. Lee, as we look to the fed cattle market trend of last week, basically uneventful. This market is more or less, at the moment, treading water. Yeah, I think that's a good way to to term it. There was some positive news that I think overall led to a a, a bit of a higher week, but really no one big factor that's going to move the market um, at this point. We look at fed cattle futures. They're in the range of about a buck to a buck and a half above the week previous. Feeder cattle, you've seen a little bit more strength on the higher end, up about $2.30. So I think overall a, a, a bit of a positive week. I think that's follow through from some, some bearishness the week before. We did see a bit more trading Tuesday than we expected, and then we've seen a bit more trading Friday and, and some positive news that, that really helped uh, the futures market. You know, we put it into perspective, fed cattle are trading about year-ago levels right now. Um, And when we look at last year, the lowest week was the last week of August. Uh, And then we've seen some strength post kind of as we got uh, post into Labor Day and and further on. So right now we're we're sitting where we were last year. Um, I think a lot of fundamentals are going to impact this market this year. But I think being steady is is a little bit positive at this point. You mentioned the positive news. To what are you referring directly there? Well, I think when we're seeing the impact of trade potentially, one, the last four weeks of trade have been relatively strong, 18% higher than a year ago. That's looking at the weekly data, very strong sales from Asia. We've seen really the impact that's having on the chuck market. We look at that cutout value, very strong values there. Also, we had news that the economy minister from Mexico would like to have a lot of the issues with NAFTA worked out as far as that bilateral trade issues. Um, And that did help spur the market. We also seen that across the board when you look at the hog market and news that China uh, will be in country to discuss many of the ongoing issues we had there. So I think trade is is very important now, as we've seen over the last several months, and the impact that's having on market. And and here's the first time we're having a little bit of, of positive news from that. The market is proven to be very reactive to this kind of news. So hopefully things will manifest themselves accordingly. I, very much. And I think the, the big thing is we're having very large supplies. And so that, that meat, poultry products do need a home. Um, and as we really enter a very key period for all the major meats, I think that, that trade strength is going to be very important. Also a factor that's got a little bit lost in this when we're talking about the impact of tariffs and everything is we've seen the dollars has quietly been moving higher, um, and so that makes our beef a little bit more expensive on the world market. On the flip side of that, it does give us a little bit more purchasing power from the import standpoint. 
Uh, we're seeing Australia still in a major drought. And, and so we could see an impact a bit on, on the grind market there as, as we have the ability to import a little bit more beef. Back on the sales front, you note, Lee, that uh, feeder cattle numbers are moving at a pretty good clip, maybe unusually so for this time of the year. What does that signify? Well, I think it, it partially signifies the, the impact that drought has having really across the country. And some of that is, is a bit of a, a regional market of where we're seeing pastures are, are drying up a little bit quicker where forage supplies are limited and we know there's going to be an impact into this fall. And so I think that that's a big factor driving that. But overall, we've seen strong feeder cattle prices. And so I think that's really triggering some of those additional sales, especially in some of those lighter weight feeder cattle. As you look at that, what implications might that have for on down the road as we get into fall? When we think of stalkers being pulled off early... You've been assessing that, you say, and think that there are very good opportunities for producers to add value to those calves and make that backgrounding program pay off. Well, I think as we sit here looking at the the futures market today, which is kind of our best indication of what feeder cattle prices are going to be over the next several months, there's tremendous value in those markets. So what they're setting up for is very strong margins for background or stocker retained ownership of those feeder cattle. When you're looking at a, pretty much a flat feeder cattle board at about 151 as we get out into November and, and just a little bit lower in January, you're looking at the same price and marketing more pounds. So that, that gives quite a bit of incentive to hold on or, or purchase those feeder cattle. Now, a lot of factors can change, one factor being that you know, right now, that's expectation, that relatively low feed cost. Mm-hmm. Corn prices are, are relatively low. There's a lot of factors that are, are bearish for that market, trade being one, another being expected larger yields. If we, if we did see a change there, that could impact feeder cattle prices some. Another factor is that, you know, I don't know if we exactly know when or if more feeder cattle are going to come onto the market. We're starting to enter that period now where there's typically a run of feeder cattle. Uh, that could pressure the market. So far, it really hasn't. We've seen strong sales, and we've seen th- those prices hold. But, again, we could see some pressure there. And then the biggest factor driving those feeder cattle prices are live cattle prices. And right now, we've seen pretty steady live cattle prices. But realizing there's going to be a relatively large market-ready supply coming on market from now into October, um, and if those supplies are a little bit larger than expected or demand is a little bit less than expected, that could really pressure prices, and we're going to see some fallout in the feeder cattle as well. But as you say, with feed grain prices at a level that would allow profitability in retaining ownership and uh, backgrounding those calves, that is a a winning proposition for producers by and large. It is, and when you compare it really to the cattle feeding market, you know, this is one market that looks like could make some money this year and and add that on to the retained ownership of cow-calf producers or the margin operators, be it stocker or backgrounder, those margins are, are looking pretty positive, and I, I think that you know, really could help spur some of the market um, that we've seen lag for much of the year. Again, drought associated, the concerns over forage supplies being tight this fall and winter, could that affect the pace of cow culling? And if so, is that much of a market driver in and of itself? Well, I think, you know, identifying that there's quite a few issues when, when we look at the drought, and it's not only just the, the drought-like conditions that, that we've seen. The U.S., we're seeing nationally, last year, about 30% of the U.S. was, was in, in any one drought category. This year, it's closer to 60%, so it's more nationwide that, that's being affected by this. But beyond that, we have relatively short supply of forages. So the haystacks we brought in May 1 were really historically tight. So there's a little bit less room for air uh, as far as this year's forage production and having that availability coming into this fall and and then into winter. Now, likely there was going to be more culling of cows this year uh, just because we have more cows and the incentives to hold cows another year are less. But because of those forage issues, I think that could cause a few more of those 
cows to show up on in the market. We've already seen that market deteriorate quite a bit. Um, and so really the market's telling you market those cows sooner than later uh, because of maybe a few more expected supply. Well, Lee, let's conclude on this. The cattle on feed report is due out from the USDA this Friday. What are the general expectations of those numbers? When you look across the board on the three major, I think we're looking at above year ago on, on the on-feed number for August 1, placed in July, should be up about 3 to 4%, and then marketed in July, I think up 4 to 5%. Why that marketed number is going to be a little bit larger is there was one more slaughter day available in July 2018 compared to in, in July 2017. If there's any real surprise in this market, I think it's going to be that marketing number uh, because supplies are building right now from market-ready supplies and soon-to-be market-ready supplies. So if that number doesn't stay relatively high, we're likely to see this as a very bearish report. I think the market really has already bid into it the larger placement numbers. We've seen the strength in marketing, um, and we've seen kind of that continued trend of 3 to 4% above year ago. But I'm really looking at that marketing number as an indication of how current we are in this market, which I don't think we're in any dire situations yet. But that's going to be a real barometer of what's going to affect this market for the next six weeks or so. And you said it right there. The feedlot sector has been very capable of staying current for some time now. And hopefully this next report will not suggest that it's going in the other direction. That's your point. Yes, very much so. I, I think right now we're he heading into a real key period here the next six weeks. That's what the futures market's reflecting is, is a relatively large supply. As we get into November, December, futures markets are reflecting that that, that supply is going to ease a bit. So I think we're looking at this report that that doesn't change that situation, that maybe you know we're holding on to those cattle a little bit longer. That's going to push it more into November and December um, and build up those supplies. Those new numbers on cattle on feed coming out from the USDA this Friday. We'll be watching for those. And as always, Lee, thanks for your input. We'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you. He is Lee Schultz, livestock economist at Iowa State University. And he routinely joins us to share his thoughts on the cattle trading trends here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today and glad to have you back as we share now some thoughts that were expressed at the K-State Ranching Summit last week here on the campus. It was a diverse program and one of the more unique presentations got into what were termed disruptive technologies and how the beef cattle industry adapts to those. We'll get clarification on what that means in a moment with the individual who brought this topic up. He is from the University of Nebraska, the director of the Engler Agribusiness Entrepreneurship Program at UNL, and a cow-calf producer in his own right, Tom Field, with us. Tom, first of all, thanks for being at K-State and sharing your comments. And when we talk about disruptive technologies, that begs for some sort of a definition here. Well, the classic definition on disruptive technologies is, is a concept, idea, or leverage pulled off by a small, uh, young, or early entrant to an existing industry that literally rewrites the business model. So the, great, the, the classic example is Uber you know, the world's largest taxi company that owns no cars because they do it all through connectivity. And they figured out that the, the key was, could we find drivers who wanted to make money who already owned cars and we would just connect them to clients. And uh, of course, it's the billion dollar idea and one of the real success stories, not without its bumps and bruises, but one of the real success stories of the entrepreneurial world. So it's about out-of-the-box approaches to, well, any kind of enterprise really then, right? Yeah, it's really taking any, any kind of a problem and flipping it on its edge or looking for 
in stagnant markets, people get into a rhythm, and they and they it happens in agriculture us all the time. We get into a rhythm. We do certain things in response to certain stimuli, and it might be the calendar. It might be you know, when a, when a, when we designate that a crop is actually ready to harvest, etc. And we get in this rhythm. Well, what disruptors do is they come in and they look at that rhythm and they go, there might be a different way to do this. Or there might even be resources that are not being leveraged for value that could really be leveraged for value. One of our great fun stories is we've got a young guy that runs a, a premium porta potty business. And he, the problem he wanted to address was the fact that women at events just despised little blue porta potties they just didn't like them because it was it was an unpleasant experience so he designed these high-end bathroom trailers for higher-end events and he has built an amazing company uh stala services in lincoln and is busy year-round has a number of people working for him and he just took a, a an old idea and just flipped the model so specific to beef cattle production, what are the disruptive technologies on the forefront or uh, on the horizon? Well, I think you know, and it, there's a lot of old ones, actually. And Mark Gardner talked about one of those um, uh, in AI, artificial insemination. is a very disruptive technology in its own right that has been adopted by some really forward-thinking producers like the gardeners um, in a really big time way as it has been across Uruguay and Brazil and Israel and yet we're a little slow to the game as a total industry so AI is still a disruptive technology that hasn't been leveraged to its full point I think the next big one is is real-time animal well-being monitoring and um, companies like quantified ag we heard I think topcon here is a company working in that space a little bit but the ability to actually in real time determine the welfare of, of cattle. And, and cattle want to hide their symptoms from their handlers because they're prey animals. It's, a, it's, a, it's an inherited tendency in them. So we need, to, we need to get real time data out of that animal so that we can anticipate before they show a symptom, we actually can find them earlier treat them quicker. We lower our total use of antibiotics, antimicrobials when we do that. And so I think there's real opportunities in that particular space. And there are probably scores of other examples out there. We could spend all day talking about those, actually. Absolutely. And, and plus, I think the other thing that I, I think is really important is, is that I think America's farmers and ranchers can take what they're already very good at, which is solving problems, and apply that problem-solving capability to even industries outside their own scope. I think rural America has the capacity to create really extraordinary companies that solve problems up and down the supply chain across society. So while I'm really interested in agriculture, what I am a sort of an evangelist for is is rural people not being afraid to tackle great big problems because I think I think we can solve a lot of problems from the heartland. Tom, another thing you spoke about was what amounts to the avalanche of data from different sources and making all of that click together in a functional way for in this instance the cattle producer and achieving that's a tall order it would seem too. Yeah, integrating data, I mean, having data is one thing. Turning data into information is another. And then turning information into real-time decision-making is a completely different process. And integrating across realms. And so let's just take a downstream user, uh, a restaurant, for example. Today, there's no integrated software technology that allows them to manage people, cash, and product. Um, They have to use three separate systems. And uh, the National Restaurant Association is actually begging someone to come in and come up with an integrated solution that allows them to better manage their staff, manage their money and their cash flow and their table flow um, during a daily operation, plus then their inventory and order. Because, uh, you know, to make money in 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 the restaurant business, the last thing you want is to run out of the product you're featuring or to have product go bad on the shelf because then that's just cash out the door that you that's just a, a pure fixed cost. So it's really interesting seeing how integration is the new challenge. But what's exciting is, is we now have a generation of people who are completely comfortable in this space. I'm really, really confident that those solutions are going to start to come. But that's why those of us who are a little older, we need to invite the youngest talent in the room to the table 
Um, in our organization, for example, all of our strategic planning initiatives are led by our youngest staff. That isn't to say that the more seasoned individuals in the arena should not embrace change. Oh, absolutely not. We we need to be we need to lead in that, and I and I think what my well, of course my staff refers to me as the, as the gray hair, but a little gray hair in the room. What we do is we help provide some history and some some knowledge about things that have gone wrong, some solutions that can come. But I, I think being wildly curious is is critical, and I. Th- if, if I can encourage every farmer and rancher in this country to do one thing in the next year, that's to reignite their curiosity. One more thing that you pressed in your presentation, and that is machines, technology can do a myriad of things, but there are things germane to the beef cattle industry that they can't do, and that needs to be kept well in mind likewise. Absolutely. We're not going to find all the solutions through um, machines and technology and algorithms. As a matter of fact, we'll be deeply disappointed if we anticipate that's a, the outcome we're going to get because it's not going to happen. Machines can't empathize. They don't tell stories. They're not particularly creative, especially on a large-scale, broad-scale approach. Like at a community level, they're absolutely disastrous. And the other thing is they, they don't do a good job planning on in complex systems because they miss certain key indicators that are qualitative as opposed to quantitative. So I think the, the name of the game is this, that really machine learning and technology makes people better at what they do. In some cases, yes, there will be jobs that, that will be replaced, but I think more jobs will be created and more opportunities exist because of that. But machine learning in and of itself is a neutral thing. It still takes the human brain and the human heart to make it all work. And one final thing here, you are a cow cow producer, so you look at disruptive technologies. What particularly excites you? What's coming down the pipe that that you think would be, if nothing else, a a thrill (laughs) as far as adaptation? Well, and and one's very simple, and it's actually we would love to know which gates are open when. And so we're actually thinking, we we know a little company that's working on that, and we're, we're thinking about that would be really magic in our environment I um, mean, our manager really loves that idea. So that's a simple one, but it's one that would be very helpful if we could start every day in the morning knowing are the gates shut that should be gotten again, the open should be open. Um, but secondarily, and, and something I'm really excited about is is the ability to to use blockchain for me to transfer data downstream with the cattle as they leave our ranch, and then to receive back from the the supply chain or real time information back about how our product performs. And through that, potentially even partnerships and access to markets that we wouldn't have gotten to without that. So we're really excited about packaging data and tying it to the products we produce because if we're going to be in this business, we need to be in it to own it, in it to win it, and that means claiming ownership of everything we do. Your message to producers out there, don't fear technology, engage in it. Don't fear it, engage in it, be smart about it. There's, there's, there's no silver bullets, but it's, a, it's an opportunity and it's, it's a set of tools that, that will make, um, I think, life interesting and better and certainly do a, help us do a much better job connecting to our customers. Tom, your presentation, highly interesting. And thanks for sharing a few moments with us right here. Appreciate you coming to K-State. Well, we really appreciate the opportunity to be at a wonderful institution like Kansas State University. He's Tom Field from the University of Nebraska, and he directs the Engler Agribusiness Entrepreneurship Program at UNL. And he talked about the topic of disruptive technologies in the beef cattle industry at the K-State Ranching Summit on the campus this past week. Agriculture Today returns after a few moments away on this, the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Thank you. 
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. Over to today's agricultural news page now and these headlines courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the U.S. and China reached a modest breakthrough in their trade dispute, saying that they would hold lower-level talks later this month on the dispute. Officials from both countries said that a Chinese vice minister will travel to the U.S. at the invitation of the Treasury Department to discuss trade issues this Wednesday and Thursday. The talks would be the first in more than two months. During that time, the Trump administration imposed tariffs on tens of billions of dollars of Chinese goods, Beijing responded with levies of their own. The dispute has hit China's stock markets and currency hard, while largely sparing U.S. markets so far. China has pledged to retaliate against U.S. tariffs in equal scale and equal strength, as they stated it. Now trade analysts are saying that the U.S. plans to move ahead in coming weeks with penalties on $200 billion more in Chinese goods are raising the stakes. Now, these talks are necessary to avoid a complete rupture of China-U.S. relations. Although the chance of coming to an agreement is low, those the thoughts of Mei Xingyu, an analyst at a think tank under China's Commerce Ministry and a frequent critic of U.S. trade policy. The talks, to be led by Treasury Undersecretary David Malpass and Vice Commerce Minister Wang Shouwen, are meant to be exploratory, providing a way for both sides to save face should progress prove elusive, that according to people briefed on the discussions. Attention on the trade situation remains high, and the Wall Street Journal reported that the U.S. and China are aiming at developing a strategy to try and repair trade tensions between the two and potentially set the stage for a meeting between President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping. There are two international meetings set for November that would provide a backdrop for President Trump and Xi to meet, presumably to put things to rest between between the two on trade. Meantime, European Commission trade officials are slated to meet today in Washington with their U.S. counterparts to follow up on that agreement made back in July between uh, Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker and President Trump. This uh, confab in the coming weeks will be uh, focused on getting rid of tariffs on industrial goods. The targeted goods will not include automobiles and agricultural products, according to the European Commission. The working group is charged with implementing the July 20 25th EU-US joint statement, which called for zero non-tariff barriers in addition to zero tariffs and zero subsidies on non-auto industrial goods. The sides are exploring a limited trade deal that would not be as comprehensive as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, which has been put on the shelf for now. Looking at the agricultural calendar for this week, want to remind you that K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes will be hosting its annual Fall Field Day this Wednesday, August 22nd, a half a day full of field tours and timely management tips, the registration and refreshments available at 8.30 on Wednesday morning at the center, just to the south of Hayes, no charge to attend, and among the topics to be covered during the tours, the pre- and post-herbicide tools for weed control in corn, Vipan Kumar will address that, sorghum hybrid development for early season planting, Ram Puryamel will address that, and uh, Palmer Amaranth and Kosha Control and Roundup Ready to Extend Soybeans. Vipan will address that as well. Nitrogen fertilization and occasional tillage in wheat sorghum fallow rotations. Augustine Obur will take on that topic. And again, Ram Priyamal will take a look at sorghum hybrid performance comparisons. Following lunch, K-State Research and Extension agricultural economist Dan O'Brien will have his outlook for the grain markets and crop profitability for western Kansas. And K-State entomologist J.P. Michaud will talk about insect management in grain sorghum. Again, no cost to attend. You might give them a call to let them know that you're coming, 785-625-3425, so they can plan for the meal. But once again, K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, hosting its annual Fall Field Day this Wednesday, the 22nd, starting with registration at 830 in the morning. We hope you can make it to that fine program.
Also, K-State's Southwest Research and Extension Center will be hosting its field day the next day, Thursday, August the 23rd, in Garden City. It'll feature field tours, indoor seminars, and seed implement and farm supply company displays, plus more. We'll fit you in on more of those details on that particular field day tomorrow. But uh, again, K-State's Southwest Research and Extension Center's fall field day is set for this Thursday, the 23rd, just outside of Garden City. Next up for you, this week's edition of Tree Tales. Standing by with that, K-State Forester, Ryan Armbrust. Ryan? It's no secret that emerald ash borer is present throughout northeast Kansas, including the Kansas City, Lawrence, and Topeka areas, where this invasive insect has been implicated in the decline and death of countless ash trees since its initial detection in the region in 2012. This tree pest has caused a lot of attention to be focused on our community ash trees and has been blamed, often correctly, for damage done to these trees. However, not every ash tree that looks rough is infested with emerald ash borer. Recent droughts were severe stresses on trees across the state, with lingering effects. After a couple years of wet springs and dry summers, last winter was dry for much of eastern Kansas and continued to stress trees. Subsequent insects and diseases have taken a toll including a common disease with a long name, Mycosphorella leaf spot of ash. This disease has been known in the state due to its late-season defoliation of ash trees. Small pale green spots appear on the leaves in summer, and by September these spots have turned yellow and brown, causing a severely scorched appearance on affected trees. Many trees will have completely lost their leaves by the end of September, leading to concerns over the tree's well-being. The good news is that late-season defoliation of deciduous trees is rarely fatal by itself and causes much less stress to the tree than early-season defoliation. While any loss of leaves represents a reduction in the tree's ability to photosynthesize, leading to stress, a loss of leaves just a few weeks before natural leaf drop is nothing to fret about. The ash tree should overwinter just fine and recover from defoliation caused by Mycosphorella leaf spot. In fact, This same logic holds for most species of deciduous trees that may suffer from late-season defoliation, such as buckeyes, hawthorns, and walnuts. In most cases, they will suffer no long-term impact or loss of overall vigor. It's worth noting that there are no commercially available cultivars of ash that offer resistance to Mycosphorella leaf spot, but even if there were, it would be unwise to plant a species that will require high levels of future care and insecticide in the face of the emerald ash borer. It's best to plant a diverse mix of tree species, and selecting species and cultivars that possess resistance to known diseases will ensure fewer concerns for tree health in the future. I'm Ryan Armbrust, Forest Health Specialist with the Kansas Forest Service, and this has been another Tree Tale. Thanks, Ryan, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. Welcome back to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. I'm Jeff Wickman. The Kansas 4-H Dog Conference and Quiz Bowl is being held October 20th and 21st at Rock Springs 4-H Center near Junction City. This year's theme is 4-H Dogs Under Construction. Northwest Area 4-H Specialist Daryl Waldron says this annual event is a unique program for 4-H youth accompanying parents, volunteer leaders, and extension staff. And it's unique in the sense that it's one of the few events where 4-H members can bring their dog with them to a 4-H event and actually have a learning experience with their dog as they go through workshops and other um, activities. Most times you can't bring the dog with you, but we've worked out a deal with Rock Springs 4-H Center where they allow that for this one-time event. And as a result, you do have some dog rules along with the 4-H youth member rules, and one of those is making sure that they have the health check and all of their immunization records up to date. Yes, and that's standard for anything in the 4-H dog program that says immunizations for dogs always need to be up to date, but we do have a couple of vets there that go through a vet check, and they check the dogs to make sure that everything's up, and they have to have this verification on a paper form, 
that they show the the vet, and they just go through things, and, and we work it out that way. You have what is called a track one and a track two. What is track one? Well, track one is about five different workshops that we offer, and they're repeated workshops, and we have three different slots, so three different times that they'll be offered, and participants can pick three of the five, and they go for about an hour in length, and then they rotate to another workshop. It's up to each family, because this is also for the family, so parents and grandparents and Siblings also sometimes come, so it's designed to be a a family-oriented event. So they get to pick, if they want the first track, they can pick uh, three or five workshops. And then we also have an advanced workshop, track two, and this year it will concentrate on rally obedience. And that's one of the four disciplines that we offer in 4-H Dog from showmanship, obedience, rally obedience, and then agility. So this year we'll concentrate on rally obedience. In terms of the Track 1 workshops, what kind of things will they learn through those workshops? I'll just go down through the different five titles we've got for this year. Um, first one is Building Backyard Agility Equipment, because that's a, a fun discipline in 4-H Dog, and so they'll get some tips on how they could create some of their own home agility equipment. Doc Dogs is going to be a program that we'll hear about, and then we have a vet tech who will be teaching, I've got a new puppy, now what? Then one of the things that we you know often teach about in 4-H is the... 4-H citizenship, giving back to the community. So they're going to be constructing dog toys through 4-H citizenship. So they'll be making something and then being able to give those to people that need it. And the last one is about the program. It's called Canine Good Citizen Program, and that'll be taught by a, a, a veterinarian in the Wichita area. So they get to pick three of the five of those. The 4-H members are also then encouraged to do some other activities. They, they've got some speeches and some self-directed activities they can do. Yes. We've let it lay out a couple of years, the 4-H presentations, and this year they'll be able to do dog-related prepared speeches, and those will be for demonstrations, illustrated talks, public speaking, and project talks. So they'll be able to uh, register for those when they sign up for registration. And then on Sunday morning, one of the options we're bringing back is called dog-related impromptu presentations, and this is where you pick a topic from a cup or a bowl and it's on a dog related topic and you have a few minutes to prepare your thoughts and then you give a short impromptu speech about that particular topic. So we brought those back. We'll have a dog kit there. These are dog learning labs. This one is the dog learning lab that's put out by Ohio State University and it has all sorts of learning activities that they can go through hands on and we'll have that set up for both Saturday and Sunday where they'll be able to self-direct themselves through these type of educational experiences and then The big thing on Sunday is the quiz bowl where we have organized teams that will quiz off with dog questions. And then we also have the open version for those that are just signing up and we assign them to teams. And then we also have a little mini version from seven to nine-year-olds, those that are just thinking about getting started. And we'll make that a fun experience while they learn how the whole dog quiz bowl questions work, how the equipment works. And so we've got something kind of designed for everybody who could participate in some phase of quiz bowl on Sunday morning. And then we have medallions at the end that we give to the first and second place teams in the senior division. You also have the 4-H Dog Olympics and a scavenger hunt? Yes. You know, one of the things that you have the challenge for any conference is how do you make it look different and new every year so it's just not the same old, same old. So we've got 4-H Dog Olympics organized this year where we'll have six different activities where they'll be able to rotate through and do different activities. Some of them they'll be able to do with their dog and some will lend themselves to that, but we'll make it as inclusive for both dog and owner as we can. The scavenger hunt Saturday afternoon where they'll be able to go through a course around the Rock Springs 4-H Center and hit different stations and then proceed on around. And it's just a way for them to be able to get out and do some activities and exercise and motion with their dog uh, in an organized activity. You also have a special presentation based around the rally obedience. Yeah, we're going to start off with a presentation by Susan Keller, who's a a dog trainer in Manhattan. She's really good at several disciplines, including agility and rally obedience. So she'll be working with a presentation, and then that's sort of the lead into why we're doing a track two on rally obedience, because we're going to focus on rally in 2018. Who might really benefit from going to this dog conference? Well, again, it's designed for the 4-H member with an opportunity to bring his or her dog or dogs so obviously it's for the 4-H member, but you know we know that it's a family affair, so we also open it so that parents and 4-H leaders and extension staff can also come. So it's got a kind of a wide cross-section for a lot of people who would learn from it, because there are sessions the adults also can learn from these workshops and also observing in track two, though that they can't 
actually do track to, but they can certainly be there to observe. And just the quiz bowl questions. So it's not only is it educationally focused strongly, but it also is a lot of fun. So And they'll be able to do it with their friends and their dogs and their family members. Dogs and camping sounds like a winning combination. I think it is. Tell me a little bit about the registration process and the cost. Well, registration will be offered through our CVENT registration system on the Kansas 4-H website, which is at www.kansas4-h.org. And on that homepage, you'll see where you click on for registering for events. It'll be there in the latter part of this month or probably by the 25th. You sign up there. All participants coming have to go through the CVENT system and complete that process. Cost this year will be $120 for full-time, and if you want to just come on day Saturday or day Sunday, it'll be $70 for Saturday and $50 for Sunday. And that registration needs to be completed by October 8th in order to be able to come to this year's dog conference and quiz bowl. That's Northwest Area 4-H Specialist Daryl Waldron. Again, for more information about the Kansas 4-H Dog Conference and Quiz Bowl, set for October 20th and 21st at Rock Springs 4-H Center, visit kansas4h.org, kansas4-h.org. And if you have specific questions for Daryl, his contact information is listed on the website. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.